Hey there, boils and ghouls. Welcome to this week's episode of Hollow Weekly. Nick here with special guest Josh Bragg, a.k.a. Haunting Season, which that name is awesome. <laughs> I love the name Haunting Season. Like, like I, I, I saw a couple of your TikToks. Like, this is before, like, we messaged each other. Like, I was on TikTok. I saw it. I was like, oh, okay, I like that. And then I gave it a heart. Scroll, scroll, scroll. So another one. I like that. Then I hit heart. And I was like, what's this name? Haunting. Oh, pfft, haunting season. <laughs> Damn, that's a good one. Yeah, there was. I, I don't remember what the other options were, but like we were coming up with that name in 2013 and Breaking Bad was like at its peak. And we were messing around with like Breaking Bad puns and stuff. And then someone... I'll take credit. Probably me. Probably you. Said haunting season and the whole room went quiet. I, I don't know. There's nothing better than like when you're coming up with a name and like you find like the perfect one. Oh, yeah. Because like when we got started with this, uh, my fiance came up with it. She was like, Hollow Weekly. And we're like, oh, yeah, like Halloween Weekly. Well, that's great. But before we had like yeah. shitty names. It was like horror and coffee because we like horror. And we like It's like, <laughs> oh, dude. Come Every on. episode will be trying a different kind of coffee. Oh. But that's the thing. You got to like, you got to narrow it. Down. It can't be two things. It's got to be one thing. And I don't want that much coffee. I like my cold no, brew and oh that's about God. it. Yeah. Do you ever do, I tr every time I try to do the hot black coffee, I do like the pinch of salt to cut the bitterness. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been telling people at work and they don't believe me. They're like, come on, man. Yeah. It no, just it's true. It just uh, to, unbitters it. Point them to Alton Brown. He's the he's the nerd who really pushes oh, of that. Of course it was Alton Brown. Yeah. He, he's like, good, <laughs> did, 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 good eat. <laughs> <laughs> He's like throwing salt in everyone's face. Yeah. Uh, so before we jump into it, like I am, I am really curious about the TikTok and how it got started because uh, you have the you have the YouTube which has blown up recently, and I discovered you through TikTok. What is your story behind starting it on TikTok? Because like to me, that's a that's the wild west. Like I never when the TikTok ads first started coming out, I was like this shit sucks. This isn't going to mm -hmm. take off. And now it's like, we'll be like watching reruns of like <laughs> crime shows. Like there's a show on Discovery Plus we love called See No Evil. Mm -hmm. So we're just watching that and then I'm on TikTok just like scrolling through. So how did all that? Yeah, it's addictive. It really um, is. Yeah. It, oh gosh. Um, well, so the YouTube show was something I, I had tried out back in 2013, 14 and uh, had to go on hiatus. Like I had a buddy fell off a cliff and he's okay um and then i got a divorce and she's okay and then um <laughs> she fell off a cliff <laughs> yeah. um and then i moved out to the west coast and like got pretty much my dream job and things have just been like churning you know mm -hmm. working really really hard i'm in video production and um it's a lot of work and i travel a lot and i'm gonna answer your question um so in october we're, we're starting to get to the place with our company. We do a lot in like pharmaceutical world and like rare diseases. And we're getting to the point where because we're all filmmakers, getting back to like traditional entertainment, like how mm -hmm. do we get back into that place where our hearts were in college, you know, now that we're adults and make a little bit of money, like what's our first move? And I was like, well, you know, there's still like 16,000 people subscribed to my YouTube and I kind of get messages like weekly, like, are you dead? Cause I just ghosted, <laughs> I just left. I just right. was like, can't do it. Not gonna look at it. That's um, a good feeling though when people care and you're like, yeah. what? Yeah, yeah, this? yeah. And so I pitched to the company, like what if we brought back haunting season, but like as a podcast, cause we've been doing a lot of podcasting mm -hmm. in the rare disease space. And it just mm -hmm. seemed like the easiest answer to the show. Right. And uh, for the for those people listening who don't know who I am, because I'm not some like mega, you know, 16,000 people isn't a lot when you consider <laughs> the whole world. Um, my show is I write and tell scary stories with 360 degree soundscapes. Uh, so it's like a movie for your ears. That's... And I just stand in a black void. We're actually sitting right next to it. Right. And this is the void. <laughs> it is black and um, it is a void. Say hello, void. <laughs> and um and that's the whole show. And so when we brought it back as a podcast, we were experimenting with like interviewing authors, interviewing, you know, anybody who would want to be on the show. And all the meanwhile, in the background, my wife is scrolling on TikTok, this new app that I thought was just about dancing. Right. And, you know, right. like that was the first initial like, oh, everybody learns these dances, I guess, because on Instagram, it started to like feed in. Right. And mm -hmm. Instagram was the first social media app that I really felt drawn to other than YouTube. Um, and so I started seeing it feed in, but it was always like people dancing and like 
less clothing than I normally wear. <laughs> and <laughs> and so it was this annoying thing, annoying thing, annoying thing. Eventually, she was like, just, you know, you're looking over my shoulder way too much. Just download the app. Mm-hmm. So I downloaded it. I was looking at it like December of last year. And in January, I was like, you know what? I've got this podcast now. I'm a couple months in. I should really try out this TikTok thing. So I started asking around and doing some research and everybody told me, just don't even care. Just put up, just regurgitate your content that you're creating for YouTube and just put it out there. Right. So I started doing that and it felt really kind of like fake and unorganic. Um, you, know, you know when it feels that way too. You're just like- Yeah, yeah. I was like, I'm not really trying. I'm just doing what everyone else is telling me to do. And so I started putting in some effort and things just immediately started taking off. Um, so now I've gone, uh, I started in January with zero uh, and now I've reached 114,000 people uh, following me on, <laughs> which is ridiculous, <laughs> on TikTok. <laughs> and I don't know why or how it's happening other than um, I'm trying and I genuinely like doing it. Well, there's also like, like you said, like um, when you don't feel it, like when I watched your TikToks, there was like an authenticity about like, oh, he really loves the content that he's talking about. Because you know when people don't really love it, and they're just saying it to say it. Oh, yeah. And so it's refreshing when you see someone like have the energy for it. And plus also it helps that you're very interesting <laughs> about, and you have good takes. <laughs> I'm glad you think about so. About the, the horror one. <laughs> it's so funny because like you, you guys, we connected over TikTok and then through Instagram or whatever. And there have been a couple of cases where people have reached out and been like, like you can tell they're just reaching out because it's like, well, this is, you know, I'm, I have to reach out or else nothing ever happens. And then I reach out back and it's like, oh my God, you thank you so much (laughs) and i'm like i've been screwing around on this app for like a couple of weeks it feels like you know and like i really have no idea what i'm doing do you remember like the first video of yours that like started getting like those big numbers like you upload a video and all of a sudden it has like a thousand hearts plus or something like that and you're like oh boy this is getting real i don't remember I don't remember the first one because I I was aware that there's like when you first start out your account, if you're consistent with it, they expect like TikTok, the platform experiments with you. Mm. So like the first couple I didn't, I just was like low expectation that fine. Okay. That one got like 50,000 views, but everything else is getting six. That's not real. You know, when it started being real for me was when on the regular I was getting like 1,200 mm-hmm. and then ones would pop up to like 50. And then the 1,200 would become 1,500 and then it would pop up and pop up, right? And so the most viral one I did on the movie Lake Mungo, and I think people are so split on that movie that it just spiraled out of control and it's mm-hmm. got like 1.5 million views on it. <laughs> and nothing else has ever gotten that high. I've gotten a couple hundred thousand. Right. But- that's 1.5 million people interacted like viewed liked commented like that's unbelievable where did the majority of the commenters land or was it it down the middle i can't even look at it anymore i still get (laughs) comments on that movie and i'm so frustrated with how much people hate that movie Mm -hmm. because there are people who are like buying the special edition that just came out in the uk even mm-hmm. though they can't watch it on their system here in the U.S., but oh, that's yeah. how much they love it. And then there are people who literally, one guy was like, I deleted my Netflix account because you suggested this movie and it was that bad. I think I saw that video. You responded to that guy, didn't you? I, I think yeah. I did. I mention <laughs> yeah. it almost every time I go live on TikTok because what a, what a dramatic people can be human real, being. People can be real dramatic. <laughs> I mean, that, that, you know, that's one of the things we were talking about was like some people want to talk about how bad a movie is when what they mean to say is they just didn't like the movie because there, there, there are, there are certain movies that I don't like, like I don't particularly like the child's play franchise, but I know that there's some good nuggets in there Mm -hmm. that, that, that people would like. And there's this, people would just really want to get on the hate train. Yeah. And talk about these movies. Like one of my all time favorite movies is signs. That's a good, that's a good movie. And I get afraid to say it because people have such strong feelings about M night Shyamalan. You know, which is weird because I feel like I didn't see Glass, but I felt like the visit and split like that, that, that resurgence run he had. I thought that was a really strong couple yeah. of films he had. Glass was great. It was like uh, if if you let M. Night Shyamalan make a Marvel movie, like that's what you mm. got. Or maybe DC. It was a little bit darker, you know, <laughs> but still. But it's weird that Science is, is the one because 
we just, it's actually funny you mentioned him. We just rewatched The Sixth Sense. Mm. And even no matter where you land on him, like you can't deny the fact that he's had some home runs. And I think Science is one of them. Yeah. That yeah. score is scary. I was playing uh, some online games with some friends, and he was like, I really like Signs, uh, saying it was one of his favorite horror movies because he's not a big horror guy, but he loves Signs. And I re-listened to part of the score, and it's terrifying. <laughs> that score is creepy yeah. as fuck. It is, and the um, the sound, my brother. So that was one of the movies my brother and I would put on when my parents were out for the night, and it was just us, and we could turn off oh. all the lights in the house, and we would put on signs because he's four years younger than I am, and when we did that with the ring, it didn't go so well. So <laughs> <laughs> signs was like that perfect, like, hey, do you want to watch signs? You want to get scary? And the DVD menu is just the baby monitor with the sounds of the aliens, and even just that, like right now, thinking about it puts chills up my spine like that clicking and clacking and there's he's he's got he is i think he's very underrated in the terms of like what he's best at a Mm -hmm. lot of people they think m night they think of the twist but he is really good at like um i think i would describe as like getting under your skin Mm -hmm. and then just like kind of creeping you out when you're least expecting it because like even the music and and some of the scenes in the sixth sense like after we were done watching it we were going to bed and i went to go feed the cats and i turned off some of the lights and all of a sudden i felt a shiver go down my back yeah i'm like this motherfucker (laughs) yeah yeah he gets right up in there and it's because of his connection to the human story and you know they say like a zombie movie is never about the zombies right Right, but like nowadays the zombie movies are about the zombies um but the great films, and and I consider both of those, Sixth Sense and uh, Signs, to be like truly great films. There's so much about the human journey mm-hmm. and so, have so little to... Anytime someone complains about the CGI of the alien at the end of Signs, like, who cares? That's four minutes of the entire movie. And you, ha- you have Walking Phoenix knocking out of the park. Mel Gibson. <laughs> oh, no, Mel he's, Gibson knocking it out of the park because he's good. And I will say, as, even though he's he, he is got his problems, The Patriot is a really good movie. That was the first time I cried in the movie theater. Was it really? Yeah, Heath Ledger. <laughs> oh god. Oh yeah, that's a that is a no. But Mel sad. Gibson here here's I, I believe this is in the behind the scenes or maybe it's an urban legend, but um. Uh, Mel Gibson was no it is in the behind the scenes of signs Mel Gibson is talking about how he was just phoning it in because he was like this big movie star and he was just like uh what you know I know what people like and M. Night like this young very very young director leaned in Mel Gibson's ear and was like come on man you're better than this why aren't you why aren't you giving me what you got and it changed everything. It changed the whole movie. Damn. Yeah. See, that's a good director. Yeah, even to the point where they were filming that scene where the aliens are on the TV and Meryl and Mel Gibson are sitting on the couch looking at each other and they have that like deep conversation of like, are you a, a I believe this is a sign person or are you a believe like I, this is the end of times type of person? Mm-hmm. And they have that back and forth and it's really, really powerful. Mel Gibson was supposed to be showing uh we were soldiers or something like that at the white house and he had to go and they were supposed to be filming that scene and they were like running out of time because it's production and um m night was like don't worry about it guys we'll we'll do it tomorrow and mel gibson and um joaquin look at each other and joaquin's like i'm good to go and mel gibson's like let's do it and they did like one take each jesus christ yeah that's that's good filmmaking yeah (laughs) yeah and that's because they actually like cared. So I, I have a huge heart for M Night and especially that movie. Well, I'm really curious um, about like uh, your upbringing as a horror fan because everyone, the way everyone gets into horror is so drastically different. Like we were talking on the phone, George got in from like the Universal Classic Monsters. I got into it by Halloween, Frankenstein kind of stuff. But then also like by the time, you know, for in my, in my for my time. Um, like the reruns of like Nightmare on Elm Street three on TV and like all mm-hmm. the all the reruns. What was like what got you into horror? Like do you remember like the first time they scare the shit out of you and you're like, This rocks. Yeah, and it's oh man, it's so mild. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my best friend growing up in elementary school, his name was Brent, and I would like every weekend be at his house and he had older brothers and he was the youngest and so we kinda got like free reign. You know, like mom and dad were already broken in. So like mm-hmm. there's only you can't really get in trouble. Um, and we would go to the Blockbuster and we would rent things like Speed, um, you know, rated our movies that aren't necessarily inappropriate. They just had like action scenes that were like, mm-hmm. you know, or whatever. And we got really into like really into Jurassic Park and Twister. 
those two movies and they're you know not i'd say jurassic park is a horror movie um i agree twister isn't but as a kid who's like just learning about tornadoes and <laughs> and the natural disasters like that was scary um you have your so, home just flying up in the sky yeah and th- those like ignited that um that excitement in me that I I knew then that I liked being scared and that mm. I craved being scared um, in a safe setting. But my dad is a minister and I would uh, I grew up like hanging out in the church during the week when no one was there. And there would be um, there was, it was in Pennsylvania, um, kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it had this giant basement that was like pretty much the size of the whole church and there were no windows. Oof. And so you could go down there and it would be pitch black like zero light and i would just go down there and explore no flashlight just like oh. down there in the dark because i craved that like fear but i didn't get into true horror until high school really when i saw the ring and when i saw signs it was like around 2002 so those, those 2003. were the big ones yeah those were the ones where i was in the movie theater and just like seeing it on the big screen with the real sound and just freaking out the ring is a good the ring and signs that's a good combo to like really Draw you in, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the the viewing of the ring? I do. I I remember like I remember the energy of it for the most part of like the teen girls screaming. And <laughs> I went to the movie the other day uh, to go see um, Separation, which I ended up just really not liking. Um, but when I got there, I, the only other two people in the theater there was a guy to my right, and there were two teenage girls behind me. And I saw them, and I was like, "Oh yes, this is going to be one of those experiences <laughs> where I got the girls screaming, and like that just it just there's something about the movie theater when there's like teen girls screaming that like makes mm-hmm. it for a horror movie. And uh, they were dead silent the entire film. That sucks. <laughs> that sucks when you when you, when you expect that theater. We the only thing I had sort of that was when we saw The Witch. Oh. And like I loved it, and then like these like teenagers in front of us went, "That sucked." And I was like, "What? <laughs> what? That ending scared the shit <laughs> the shit out of me." There's a uh, my brother and my best friend and I went and saw the happening when it came out, and someone stood up at the end and said, "And I'll never forget because we <laughs> quote it all the time because it's such a stupid like it just didn't come out right." But she was like, "Man, three strikes out, and this guy's out. This guy." <laughs> what? <laughs> like she stood up and announced it, and we were like, "That didn't go the way you thought it would." Yeah, you you yeah. look foolish. There's a lot of um really interesting times where like you have the perfect movie theater experience, like with horror films in particular, because mm-hmm. you get that reaction. Is there any horror films that like real like movie theater horror uh theater experiences? The all time greatest for me was I got to see the thing in oh. the theater at Banff uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I don't even know how I found out it was happening, but I like called everyone I knew and I was like, they're showing the thing, they're showing the thing. Um, Cause that was one of those, like the first, th- that might've been the first vintage horror I've ever seen. And it un- it just opened my soul um, like a carcass full of teeth. <laughs> um, it just like, it it awakened something in me. I attribute that to be like the true start of like the journey. Cause like for me, the ring, I was in love with the story and mm-hmm. the detective work and the mystery with signs. I was in love with the characters. You know, I wasn't like craving that like gore or um, psychedelic, you know, freak right. out until right. I saw that. Well, that's interesting. Cause I, um, one of the things we talked about, and you've done a few TikToks on it that I think is really fascinating is how um, you're now exploring the slashers genre, which actually, after hearing this, makes a lot of sense because you're very character driven. Where the slashers, you know, they turn the characters down to like a two. Well, and, <laughs> and I, I up like up straight up. up boycotted it all through college. Like all my friends would be like, "Oh, do you want to watch this slasher film?" I'm like, "I don't do slashers." Where does that come from? Because, well, um, I think Christianity. Um, <laughs> growing up in the church, <laughs> okay. part of me had this like. I, my my parents introduced me to great movies. My mom specifically, like Annie Hall, and um, I don't know. Like we were always watching comedies together. My dad was great war movies, great action movies, uh, great dramas, and so I had this sort of like pride of like. And, and my mm. assumptions about uh, slasher was that it's storyless. 
that there's nothing there. It's just like killing for the sake of killing. Right. I I considered it torture porn before there was torture porn. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was at my cousin's house on a Halloween, like deep into doing haunting season. And she was like, let's watch Halloween. And I was like, fine, whatever. <laughs> and I couldn't believe how much fun it was. And then I didn't, re then I realized there's camp, you know, there's mm -hmm. camp to it. And there's like, I don't know. And then I watched Eli Roth's um, History of Horror. Right. And he talks so much about like why these films were made, when they were made and what they mean to people. And it's just, man, I, I'm excited that a lot of people on TikTok are like, I feel so bad for you that you're discovering like Clive Barker as an adult. And I'm like, no, this is great because so, I can truly appreciate it. Exactly. Because I, it's, it's funny you mentioned Clive Barker. I remember the first time my dad put on Hellraiser and I just didn't get it. And I was so bored. I remember acting like <laughs> he was like, is this too much for you? And I was like, oh, yeah, it's too much. But it wasn't. I just want to go outside and play because I thought it was boring. Yeah. I rewatched Hellraiser for the first time like two years ago. We did an episode on it. Loved it. Yeah. It, exploring things as an adult, people people think it's a bad thing. I think it's a blessing. Like you get yeah. to fully sit down and you get to comprehend it and to be able to chew on it and enjoy it. And I have so much I have so much to get through. I'm like I'm at the point now where I'm getting so many suggestions on TikTok that I'm only watching things if people suggest me to watch it. Though so if it, what's funny is you mentioned Eli Roth. How how do you feel about him as a director? Do you like do you like him, hate him cuz he's he's a very um Either people love him or hate him. I'm sort of in the middle. Like I, I love don't Cabin know Fever. If I've seen. Oh, I've seen Cabin Fever. Okay, so I hated Cabin Fever. Right. When I saw it in high school, um, and I don't know if I've seen any of his other ones because I usually see the trailer and I'm like, no thanks. Yeah, he was on an episode of Joe Bob, The Last Drive-In, and he was talking about Italian horror, and all of his answers were, "Well, you should ask the writer." <laughs> we're like, well, "What the <laughs> fuck are you here for?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, he produced the Sacrament. Which I, at first I thought he directed it, but he produced it. He had something to do with it, and I really liked that movie. Yeah, I, a, I think he knows what he's talking about. Like, um, did you like the history of horror? I loved every second. I will rewatch that. There, if I had, if I had to recommend one thing, there's back in the day, back when I was in middle school, so it was like 2003 ish, maybe like that. Bravo did this countdown called Bravo's Top 100 Scariest Movie Moments of All Time. Ooh. And dude, the line. So they have like Eli Roth on there, but they just count down. And so like number like, I think like in the top nineties is like Creep Show, and you know once you get to the bottom, it's like Jaws Alien. Like it's it's the it's the it's not a surprising list, but they yeah, have yeah, a yeah. lot. The, the middle part is the interesting part because that's where they have these gems. But they have people like Eli Roth, Rob Zombie, but then people who aren't here anymore. So they have like Stan Winston talking about it, and he even talks about like. Um, the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, because I think that's on on the list. Um, just a ton of like legends, um, and then they have some weirdos like the Coolers Light like, Girls. I don't even remember them from like the two thousands. Like, and then they have like Broken Lizards who did like Club Dread and uh, mm -hmm. Super Troopers. Like they're <laughs> oh on God. there. Yeah. yeah, it's a really weird thing. But uh, that to me would be like my version of Eli Ross history of horror. Where I, in fact, half the movies on there I probably still haven't seen, but I know all about them yeah. because they have like these great talking head pieces just passionately talking about why these these films are are great yeah it's a I, i've seen i don't know if it's that one but i like every once in a while vh vh1 will do something like that or you know there's always some sort of list i used to love vh1 yeah did you ever watch i, I love the 80s series oh yeah <laughs> oh man oh yeah <laughs> those shows were great it's so good and occasionally like around halloween they would do something along these lines and that's how i've seen some of like and i i'll know the scene and I'll be watching the movie for the first time, and I'll be like, that guy's head's going to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> it did. I remember this. <laughs> so uh, with with the slashers, it, what's how far are you into the journey of exploring them? Because it seems relatively. <laughs> really, relatively so, okay. Yeah, not very far. Is, so, Is there any on your list that people have recommended to you that you want to check out or something that like you, you, you want to get to eventually? Well, I've, I've purchased – so – Freddy Krueger is my favorite. That was the one slasher that I started exploring on my own in high school. And it was too much for my brother. Um, but I was like blown away by the creativity mm -hmm. of, of like the mind, the dreamscape. And I've seen the first three. And so I'm excited to watch the rest of them. Um, especially Wes Craven's new nightmare is supposed to be really legit. Um, I've never seen that all the way through. 
all the way through. So it's I've seen, I've like just seen it. parts of it. Oh, okay. In fact, I think I owned an action figure of him from New Nightmare. Yeah, and I hadn't seen it, so I felt like a phony having it. But I was like, yeah. I've seen the others. No, I want I want to watch all those. I, I've recently purchased because of this journey um, all of the Halloweens and all of the Jason movies. I've never actually seen Jason kill someone because I've only seen the first movie. <gasps> wow! <laughs> and I've only that... seen the first Halloween movie. Wow. Yeah. And I understand that Season of the Witch has like uh that's supposed to be like one of the great ones for Halloween three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 um that movie has had a weird history. So when it came out, people hated it. And we fought for it a couple of years ago, and it was at the same time the tide started to turn from it from it being like, Oh, it sucks because you know, Michael Myers isn't in it. Mm-hmm. But it's now at the point where people appreciate it because I always call him Tom the fuck machine Atkins is in it because I mean everyone in that film he fucks like if you like like if your mom's in the film he's gonna fuck her like that's just how yeah, it goes but the story the story's fun and it's really not a bad movie um but Halloween three I mean don't don't definitely don't skip it but like yeah yeah it's, yeah it, it's good it's definitely it's its different thing. it's definitely it, different it was on a list of because uh, while I'm writing I like to listen to horror scores and so um uh. Rolling Stone did the top 30 greatest horror scores of all time, and that was one of the ones on the list. Really? Yeah. Was it? I wonder if it was um, the score score or if uh, during the movie they have uh, the, the company, Silver Shamrock, <laughs> they have the, the mask comes on, and it goes, happy, happy Halloween. Halloween. I think it's like London Bridge or something like that, but it just plays. It'd be funny if that was there. It, it might be on Those there because there are, like I've, I've downloaded entire scores, and then there are definitely songs on different ones that I have to skip because there's like too many lyrics. What's your go-to movie score? Go-to movie score. Um, You know, recently it's been Christine. Did you hear the news about that? Uh, They're remaking it. They're remaking it, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that on Bloody Disgusting or something like Mm -hmm. that, but I didn't click on the article. Uh, But I'm excited because I was just saying to Courtney in the car when we were driving back from The Conjuring, um... I was asking her if she, so Lisey's story is one of my favorite books of all time. And it's a Stephen King book, a lesser known one. Cause it's like more about the people than about the horror. Right. Um, and they're turning it or they have turned it into an Apple TV plus show and it looks really good. And I was saying, I'm really excited that Stephen King movies are now, it, it seems like in the age of Apple TV plus Netflix, uh, HBO go all this, that, directors are now doing things because they're genuinely excited about doing something fantastic with it. And I feel like a lot of Stephen King content has been made because they're like, the book did great. We're a producer, get a director attached. I don't care who it is. You know, like that old age of filmmaking where it's just like, don't make it, you watch it. Yeah. It'll be, it'll bring back the numbers. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So people want Stephen King. I don't care what the book's about. Just make it. Well, nowadays it feels like if Stephen King's name's attached to it, they just throw it to Mike Flanagan and he's like, (laughs) I got it. I got it here. You want me to hit? They're like, what do you want to do with it? Because I don't know. I'm just going to deglove something in the film. Yeah. (laughs) Every film he does, someone's getting degloved. You know, like you go back and you watch like the Langoliers, you know, like a lot of these like made for TV ones. There's like good moments, but mostly. Do you ever see, um, because they're remaking this one too. Do you ever see Firestarter with Drew Barrymore and George C. Scott? No, but I read the book at the beginning of the pandemic. That was my first like pandemic book where I was like, you know, I have more reading time. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And I wanted to go back to his, because I've read a bunch bunch of his books um mm-hmm. not the ones you would expect and um yeah i was like uh, i i have a thing for telekinesis like i don't think there's been enough movies with telekinesis every time a telekinesis movie you. comes out i'm like so excited it's why i love stranger things so much is because i'm like finally getting that you fix got, you got stranger things and then like chronicle <laughs> like- yeah and there was that movie like uh oh i don't think it was megan but, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Which one? It had, like, great ads. They would, on Instagram, it would, like, be those moving pictures where, like, everything's, like, surging, but it's actually, like, a photo with just a few moving parts. I feel like I would know it. It wasn't Megan. It can't be Megan. No, but it, did it have Did it have the actor? <laughs> Morgan. Was it Morgan? Morgan. Oh, I God. think George, I, I, I feel like I if we saw an ad for it, I'd be like, oh, I know. Yeah, that. yeah, I know exactly. it got, like, 1% on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, Firestarter is the second best x-men film you'll ever see and if that doesn't sell you in the movie i don't know what will first of all you got young drew barrymore yeah and she's great and then it has one of my favorite actors of all time and he has a po- gross ponytail in it. george c scott is the villain and then i think michael sheen uh martin sheen martin sheen's in it as well um 
great. I mean, with those three as a cast, and I'm on yeah. a, I'm on the Martin Sheen like love train because during COVID we started watching The West Wing. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we did a we did a political ad with him like a couple years back, and he went to University of Dayton. I think he grew up in Dayton, and he found out all of us on the crew was from Dayton. He like lit up, and so I'm like, oh, whatever you're in, I'm <laughs> I'm down. <laughs> Fire Firestarter, I think you would. You would really. You watch Frank and Gracie, Grace and Frankie. No, I haven't. Oh man, watch that and just pretend. You know how like you can do like Malcolm in the Middle as a sequel to Breaking Bad. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Just so, just pretend it's a sequel <laughs> it's to The West Wing, <laughs> where he's come out of the closet and like <laughs> life is moving Jet on. Jet Bartlett. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. No, we. I genuinely love that. It's cheesy, but it's good. The King stuff is interesting nowadays. Yeah. It really is. The only King I've read is Skeleton Crew, and then I listened to the audiobook of it, and it was done by Steven Weber, who, mm. who was in his TV version of The Shining, who really crushed it. Yeah. Did oh, you... maybe I should do the audiobook of it, because I've always wanted to read Dude, it, but it's, it's like, I am such a slow reader. It is really good. It is 48 hours long. Yeah, that's great. I, I, I was trying to speed read it before the 2017 version came out which i loved that was great what did you think of the part two i loved it you liked it yeah oh man i thought it was I, good but i didn't think it was as good as the first one no no no. the first one's a great film second one they had i mean you have to you, you got to do, do it, it yeah. and it's never going to live up to when you nail it so hard but uh well hmm. um <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no i i great movie theater experiences of just like giggling like a little kid every time getting scared because it's like it's goofy and scary and they can get away with anything because he just becomes what each character is afraid of Mm -hmm. so like it doesn't matter if it scares you it only matters if it scares the character and so it can be like funny and goofy and scary well the book the book you'll love because he does king does a lot of like um classic monsters right. that scares the kids like i think dracula's in a library at one point and then he does this one thing um in the book where the creature of the black lagoon comes out from like a swamp or something like that it was one of the kids are coming home from whatever and he has this line that i've never f- forgotten like out of all the horror stuff that i've read out of all the audiobooks of the two the one line that i'll never forget is stephen king saying or pennywise saying i'll unzip your guts isn't that a gross line? Yeah. <laughs> just like oh. the thing I love about Stephen King is how like corny and cheesy he can be while still scaring the crap out of you. Right, right. Because he'll he'll have like a a scary monster called the, the like the goober guy, you know. And you're like, <laughs> oh, okay, the goober guy. And then by the end of the book, you're like, I don't ever want to think about the goober guy ever again. <laughs> <laughs> he scares the sh- scares the shit out of me. Did you see Rose Red? The made for TV movie? No, that's not a bad one. It's another one of those long ones. It's not the greatest, but I think it has some good stuff in there. But back, but back to the, like the eighty stuff, like when they were just like producing shit. Yeah. The other one that I think was not too bad was Silver Bullet. Hmm. Did you see that one? Nope. All oh, Firestarter than Silver Bullet. Whenever, whenever you, you got to, I was sure everyone Is it a car to, movie. No, Silver Bullet. It, it well. In a sense, Gary Busey puts a motor on a wheelchair, if that, if that counts. <laughs> and that thing fucking flies, dude. Well, if Gary Busey did it, it counts. It has, like, the coolest... First of all, it's not a bad werewolf movie, because there's... In the long run of things, there's only, like... Silver tw- Bullet. What am I thinking of? Isn't there, like, an old, like, Clint Eastwood movie or um something with a... It was Silver Bullet. I'm derailing there's a something. there's a there's a movie called Bullet, Steve McQueen's Bullet. Oh, maybe it's just Bullet. Okay. Yeah, but okay. it's like but it's like B U L L E T T. It's like spelled fucking weird yeah. or something yeah. like that. It's got it's got it has one of those scenes that like when you're a kid and you imagine like horror movies, like how a scary scene would look. They do it. And it's just a bunch of werewolves in a church. Oh, cool. And what you would like is you have the, yeah, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. the, the church uh, bringing. Um, but what's interesting is we were talking about how um, some people want to get very vocal about an opinion in horror. Mm-hmm. I feel like the uh the Scars Guard versus Tim Curry Pennywise was another huge oh, one. Oh yeah. And how annoying did that get? Oh man, I, anything like that is just annoying because I I don't think I don't think it matters. You know, like right. people are talking about the Candyman uh remake coming out and they're like it better be fucking good. And it's like 
Well, who cares? They're not taking away the old one. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't you delete know, it. it from the, yeah, exactly. Like if they blow it, then just more people will be like, "Wait, why did they remake this?" And they'll go watch the old one. And it'll mm-hmm. be great. And if they nail it, it'll be like, "Cool. All right, here come nineteen more movies." <laughs> exactly. You're gonna get twelve more of them. Yeah. Dude, you better buckle in. Yeah. So I don't. You know, everything is is its own thing. And if it doesn't vibe with me, it's probably gonna vibe with someone else because it's getting made. You right. Know? It's like with the Conjuring universe. I don't, um, which is top of mind because I just saw it, but Mm -hmm. I watched all three Annabelle movies. I would only count one of those as official Conjuring canon, in my opinion. Which one? The third one. I thought the third one, Annabelle Comes Home, felt like a real Conjuring movie. And the other two, the first one was okay. The second one, I could not, I could barely stomach it. I thought it was so bad. Was that the, the one I liked was the, um, the one where they were at the farmhouse. Yeah, that's the second one. The second I hated one? it. Yeah, I, I couldn't stand it. I, but I understand. Yeah, you know, because it's not a terrible movie. It's just it didn't hit me. It won. Know? It won points for me. And the listeners know what I'm going about, about to say is because they had a scary scarecrow in it. And I feel like scarecrows, like for, for a while, we had a werewolf drought, and then we had a witch drought. And I feel like <laughs> scary scarecrows, we don't get enough of. Like you we really only have. Oh, I can't. I see. It's so few of them. I can't even think of the name. I that can has. only think of two: Jeepers Creepers, which I haven't seen, but that's a scarecrow, right? Kinda. Kind of. He's like oh, a, see, he's like a know, creature, though. It. It's it's weird. And then, um, isn't there? Well, I guess it's not even a scarecrow either. The the little kid from um Halloween, uh, Halloween, uh, trick or scary stories. No, what's the shit? Trick or Treat has is it Trick or Treat? He has Sam, but he's like he's, Sam, got, he's got like yeah. a sack on his head though. He's like a demon or something weird. Yeah, because he takes so it off. He's not really a scarecrow good. either. So. No, the only scarecrow I can really think of right now. There's one movie that was a scarecrow film. Return like, to Oz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, God, I can't even think of it. And like one of my friends produced it. Like <laughs> I can't even. Think, and I saw it in the theater. Like and then, and then the only other scarecrow I could think of is Scarecrow from the Batman series. Oh yeah, yeah. Like yeah. he's like he's like. Okay, we need more scary scarecrow. That's what I'm saying. Like we need, and then Harold from Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if he really counts. I don't know. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. Did you ever read those books? As a I did, and I loved them. And I recently just bought the the whole, or I guess I got it for Christmas. Um, the whole series but i haven't i haven't revisited yet i'm actually kind of a little scared i don't fucking blame you dude because first of all th- is it th- did you see the re um they redid the art for them oh no and they took like all the scariness away oh really but i hope that's not the version i have but well, the stories are still scary and, and yeah i know but the drawings are like what kept me up as a as a fourth grader who there discovered are... it next to like Mrs. Piggy's Day Off or whatever, you know? My friend. <laughs> Why is that on the bookshelf in my elementary school? My, my friend, my neighbors had it and it was scary stories and then like a book about puberty. <laughs> and I was like, this is weird, dude. Yeah. No, I remember it like there was like a shitload of Bernstein Bears books. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. there was scary stories to tell in the dark. And it's like, I, did the janitor put this here at <laughs> night or something? Like, why? It's a, it is a very out of place book to pick up when you're that age. Yeah. Um, they have uh an audiobook version of that, and you know how like in the book it's like at the end of the story, you know, you go boo and like scare everyone. Mm-hmm. They do it in the audiobook, and I was listening to it on a Southwest <laughs> flight, and I didn't know they did it, and so the story got quiet, and all of a sudden like I went or something like that, and I was like. <laughs> Play cool, play cool. You're on a plane, you know. I don't want to look like the dude from the Twilight Zone. You know, there's yeah. a thing on the on the plane, but they actually have. Um, and this is what's weird about scary stories in Tell the Dark. There's a song at the end of one of them, and the song came up one year while we were putting up Halloween decorations. Um, I think it was like 2010. It was every, when everyone was using Pandora. You mm-hmm. remember that? And the song was like, the worms crawl in, the worms crawl out. They crawl through your belly and out your snout. And then it has this trauma goes like, Wah. and it's just like, so, and it's the only time I've listened to a song like that and my stomach felt sick. And I was a, like, I was a tax paying adult. Like, like, like that shit made me feel sick. And I was like, how are these stories still scary? Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, 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 they're fucking wild. Dude, dude. Simplicity is key. I think any movie or any story that just has, it's like so complex. You have to like, really focus like you're not going to get scared it's that simple like something's moving over there mm-hmm. and i don't know what it is that's scary what scares you like in real life there's something moving over there yeah and i <laughs> that's <laughs> um, gotta... yeah it, it's ghosts really because i i truly genuinely believe in them 
and I so I did ghost hunting for a while. Yeah, I want to I want to get to that because that is <laughs> fascinating. Yeah, so I I had just discovered Twitter, and someone in Minnesota just discovered Twitter, and we were tweeting at each other, not knowing what was happening because neither of us it's not the platform for me it's not the platform for her but somehow she was like i'm a ghost hunter and i was like i've always wanted to ghost hunt and she was like come to minneapolis and i was like i got a cousin there uh let's set something up and i just like went um i've done this a few times in my life where i should have been murdered uh, (laughs) and wasn't i just had a genuinely good time right um few too many stories like that so i show up to minnesota and i meet this group and they're a bunch of like moms and dads who write children's books and they ghost hunt for inspiration and they have a group called ghost stories inc like ink um (laughs) because they're writers and some of them are illustrators and just like genuinely cool folk and i went out like every three months i would go out for a ghost hunt and i'm a filmmaker so i'd bring a nice camera audio equipment, GoPro, and like shoot the hell out of it. And I have all this footage on my hard drive. I've barely scratched the surface of. I actually had a meeting today about it. That's Um, awesome. Because it's just been sitting there since 2014 doing nothing. Nice. Um, And there's some great, great stuff in there. Um, I forget how I got on this whole track. Uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Oh, What What Am I Afraid of? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I did that whole project, something like 14 ghost hunts, and my goal the whole time was to prove to myself beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's something beyond death, that there is right. life after life. Um, and I feel like I did that for myself. Like very, I don't have evidence to prove to anybody else, but my personal experiences were enough to be like, okay, cool. This isn't it. The What I'm experiencing right now isn't the full story. And that's why I get scared of ghost movies. So that's why the review for Hereditary was a glowing, <laughs> was a glowing <laughs> one. Grandma's like, still there. Whoa, whoa! What's the? Okay, so I, I, I've been ghost hunting myself. Not I haven't filmed or done. I haven't got like the gear out to try to prove them. Just uh, we usually go because the stories are usually uh, very interesting. What's the scariest place you've been? Scariest place. Let me go through the annals of my mind. <laughs> um, this the the well. The scariest place was this poor farm um, in Minnesota, and it's now like a hotel. And it's as just most like, haunted places become. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it um, there's a graveyard of uh, it. It was just unmarked graves of everyone who died there. They would just wheelbarrow them out and bury them in the woods. And they've since been marked with numbers, but no one knows who the bodies belong to. Just that they lived at this poor house and. Um, There's like an old decrepit barn out there and there's like the way the night went. These are the things that I I remember. Um, And then, of course, I have the footage to to rediscover it all someday. We went up to. So one of the women who we go with is has uh, sensitivity to, you know, like a psychic ability. Right. Um, And she's written a book. um, And. I don't know why that's important, but legit, you know, right, like right, someone, yeah, yeah, someone yeah. Who like, and, and you talk to this person, you don't feel like, oh, okay, you got to screw it. Like average human being who has this sensitivity, right? And which that makes ghost hunting extra exciting. That's you're like, cool. Like, yeah. let me know what's going on. So we go up to this one room and, and everybody just starts getting really emotional. It's just this random, we just picked this random room. Some of us are going to go upstairs. Some of us are going to go downstairs. Right. Split up. Uh, and we have walkie talkies so we can be like, yo, did you just scream death at the top of your lungs? <laughs> oh, okay, good. Okay. Um, so we're in this hotel room and they both start weeping. Um, both Whoa. women that I'm up there with. And they're just like, I don't know what's happening. I'm just overwhelmed with sadness. And I kind of was backing up to get a bigger shot. And the bathtub was filled to the rim with water. And there's no one staying there. There hadn't been anyone staying there. You know, like we had the whole place to ourselves. Why? Whoa. You know, and like that was freaking. So we we're like, okay. And we did like some stuff in the bathroom waiting to like to see if we could contact anyone. There, there was nothing, but there was something in that room that was like very emotional. And we all kind of felt it. And, and the two of them felt it more than anybody. We had to leave the upstairs in order to, um, in order to like flush that out. 
And so then we did, we walked out to the unmarked grave site and there's one tombstone that's like, you know, some, some like here lies the bodies of 480 people who are dead now. Um, and you know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and we're standing there and there's like suddenly like, I'm sure it's like a squirrel or whatever, but there's mm-hmm. like footsteps around us, you know, it's like a little bit over there and then it stops. It's straight up just exactly like a horror movie. Damn. You know? So we're like, okay, let's get out of the woods for a while, blah, 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 blah. And so then, um, I don't know, there were other like emotional moments, but the, it all came to a head when the group from downstairs came out of the basement and they said, you have to f- fucking listen to this. And they play back their tape and you can hear like when someone's mouth is like really close to a microphone, you just hear Timothy. Like nope, that, that straight up oh, 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 the cleanest oh, oh. audio I've ever heard. We played it back like a hundred times, just being like, "Yeah, it's Timothy. It's one hundred percent Timothy." Oh. And so we went into the basement as a group in a circle, and we had our flashlights. Where okay, so the way so the. Uh, some ghost hunters do this. You use the twisty uh, flashlights where you twist on and off. Oh, yeah, yeah, and you yeah. you set it really, really sensitive. And there is, um, on the debunking side of things, the coils inside, when you have it just set right on the edge there, they heat up and they cool down. So it'll turn on and off on its own. And that's, you know, so you have to do, like, extensive proof that you're actually speaking to someone who can turn it on and off right. by having it happen exactly when you ask it. Um, and we had like three flashlights on separate parts of the floor and it's a stone floor so there's no like bumping the wood or anything and two two of them i don't remember i think at one point we had all three but two of them at the same exact point would go off and on answering our questions and so we found out timothy was a little boy he died young there he never knew his father uh he wasn't born on the poor farm but his mother was there and she died there too you know, like some details like that, that we were able over the course of like an hour able to find out. But when we got there in the basement, nothing was happening. And they were trying to like coax Timothy back in. And they're like, come on, it's okay. These are our friends. Cause there was originally like four people down there. Now there's eight. Yeah. And then everyone at the same time felt it, the temperature in the room. And I've never experienced this any other time. The temperature in the room dropped like 20 degrees. No way. Yeah. It went from being very comfortable to absolutely freezing. And that's when everything started to happen. And we stayed down there for like an hour and a half. Oh my God. Yeah. Did you ever go back? <laughs> no, I no. don't even know where the place is. Oh I, I told you, I was just strangers texted me and I got in their car and they took me somewhere. <laughs> that is like the most, like out of all the TV shows, out of all the places, like I personally have been to talk to other people, that is like the most genuine ghost hunting experience. <laughs> like I got chills thinking about that. Like, when you were telling and that. the weird thing about it too is like telling it now several years later, the, the further away you get from the actual experience, the less the less you believe it yourself, you know, the more I'm like, right. If I hadn't filmed it all and like had these reactions with so many people in the room, I'd be like, yeah, but I don't know, you know, cause that's my gut feeling right now. Even just telling it now, so many years later is like, but you know, it was dark and it was like three in the morning or whatever, but that tape, I mean, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the temperature dropping like that. That is scary. Yeah, that's scary. Scary but fun. But fun. Yeah, yeah that's it. my whole mo. It's like if it was like, and we chose as a group to never go anywhere where there was like a horrible axe murder. You know, no like Amityville stuff. Yeah. yeah, no, it's just like, oh, you've got a little ghost boy. Oh, that sounds neat. <laughs> ghost yeah, we'll come, we'll come hang out with him. That sounds like the name of the company. We're Ghost Boys. We get to <laughs> yeah, Ghost Boys go and... go around. Um, have you ever been to the Queen Mary? No, I've done a ghost tour there. No, no, no. Oh, I want to do that. You would love it because that. I mean, that ship was built like, you know, in the 30s or 40s or something like that. I've know? seen the. Uh, it's like episode one of the original Unsolved Mysteries, I think. Oh, was it really? Yeah, it, it's one of the first few episodes <laughs> tonight. On Unsolved yeah, Mysteries. tonight I'm Robert Stark. That play that. Um, I, I don't know if like it's it's particularly scary, but like the history. There's one room that's kind of fucked up. It's the. Um, because during World War II, they used to call it the Gray Ghost because the Nazis couldn't find it mm. and like attack it, and it was like definitely like a ship they wanted to fuck up because <laughs> it would take wounded soldiers uh, back and forth from England to America. Yeah. Um, but when they would capture POWs 
there was this one hole that they put him in and you go to the hole it's like the front of the ship it's hot it's muggy and you look down and it's just these floors of just like it's just nothing and it's like it stinks it doesn't oh. feel right it's hot and you could just imagine then like they would be they would say like you know it'd be crammed shoulder to shoulder full of people and you're like could you imagine being on that ship rocking back and forth for like however long <laughs> you know <clears throat> sorry <laughs> you asked me what sorts of things scare me getting stuck somewhere like that is horrifying to me. Anytime there's like a cave and someone's like squeezing through something. Oh, I, 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 that ends my ability to cope. Have you seen that TikTok about the guy that got stuck in the cave yes. and they closed it what off? What the fuck? And why did I watch the whole I, thing? I dude. watched it all the way through. It was like a three minute one too. And the guy <laughs> was like sweating and he's like, I don't want to tell you about this, but <laughs> oh, you're going to hate this. It's watch the whole fucking thing and then it or like right before bed too. Claustrophobia is is a motherfucker. Oh god. Um there's only been one horror movie that made me change my breathing pattern because <laughs> it made me feel <laughs> weird and it was um buried with Ryan Reynolds. Oh it's yeah. the one where the whole place takes place with him in yeah. a box. And I, I'm I feel you like with that claustrophobia, like it 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 wigs me out. Yeah. I can't do it. That and heights. Heights freak you out? Um Y- yeah yeah because <laughs> george and i we feel the same way about heights and uh this was right when did it come out we went and saw free solo mm, the, the yeah. where the guy climbs yosemite with i saw no that in the imax that was you saw an imax too oh, yeah yeah dude we saw at the it was clinging to the seat that was like the opening scene where he's doing like his warm-up i was i looked down at my palms and i'm like Oh, this isn't good. And I remember the guy in front of me had to like do the thing. He looked like a basketball coach. He like had to like lean forward, put his elbows on his knees, yeah. and like <gasps> there was an old couple next to me, and the man was leaning forward, and the woman was like rubbing his back. <laughs> like we, it was a shared experience. It was very special because we came out of that theater. These strangers that I saw it with like bonded for life like there was that look at each other of like we made it we survived survived the anxiety <laughs> holy crap alex reinhold is that his name yeah he's got oh like something God. there's like a part of his brain that doesn't trigger fear and so he's like well i'm just gonna climb a mountain oh and then they show mm. the people falling <laughs> Oh yeah, and then, like, the, the one guy that shot is scary. Where it's just like he, he looks like a little ant, and then like there's the trees, and you just see him fall below the tree line. And you're like, you know, he would yeah. splat. Yeah, there's. I, I watched a couple I mentioned earlier that um, oh, I guess it was before we were recording, but uh, one of our documentaries was about a guy who climbed Mount Everest. He's the first person with a bleeding disorder to summit Mount Everest, and also the seven tallest summits on the planet. Um, wow. And so we sent a guy to um to Everest but before that we watched like all the climbing movies like all of them and there's a montage oh in um um oh I just forgot the name of it something valley uh but it's about climbing in that same Yosemite Valley mm-hmm. and uh, it's got a montage of people like falling and the rope swinging them into the rocks and it's like three minutes long of just seeing people bash into no, the side that... of this cliff that makes my stomach hurt I cannot <laughs> I cannot. I can't even. That's horror. No, that that is <laughs> that that is true horror. Because I do. I have that fear of heights where, like, I can be on top of a building, but the entire time I'm afraid that something inside of me is going to run towards the edge and launch off. I have zero desire to die. I don't <laughs> ever want to die, ever. <laughs> I will do everything I can to not die. But there's still something in me when there's like an open window and we're on the 80th floor where I'm like, I better not run and jump through that window because I'll be so pissed. <laughs> I, mean, I don't you're, know what you're, that you're is. You're just falling. Damn me. <laughs> yeah. I used to hang out on the roof with my friend and uh, like at the end of the day, we'd go up on my parents' roof and the entire time I was just like spiraling about like, okay, that one missed step and then you fall and you run through the whole scenario of like, how oh. do you grab on? Blah, blah, blah. Dude, even even if we go to like the Americana and we park on like level six, I like lean over and I'm like, huh? Whoa. Uh, and then I have this fear. My fear with heights is not that I'll jump over, but that some psychopath will just grab my legs and shovel me over, and then I'm, I'm yeah. like, you know, <laughs> splat. We watch too many movies. You ever spit over the edge and like to see what the timing is, and then like plan it out in your head, and you're like, okay, I'm heavier than the spit. 
so I would fall faster, you know, and like time out exactly what how horrible it would be. Yeah, and like that that <laughs> silence. It's like the silence. The silence. The most silent silence you'll ever hear. And then you're watching your spit go, and then it splits up before it even hits the ground, and then you're like, "What was that?" Or even if you try to do it straight down, just like the most gentle of wind like sends it over there, and you're yeah. like. Oh, man. Oh. I don't like that. I, I did a cross-country road trip, and we not only stopped at the Hoover Dam, but also the, um, you know, the big empty place. Uh, Death Valley? <laughs> no. Big empty place. The taller one. Oh. Oh, God. I'm getting tired. Hoover Dam. The, um, Grand Canyon. <laughs> oh, the, the bigger one. <laughs> you know, the big empty place? The big empty place, yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're walking around there, and... And I'm already, I'm nowhere near the edge and I just like heart in my throat, just like <sighs> head beating like a heart. And, um, and my buddies are like talking about how many people die there every year and how many people like, and you can see the, like the stupid people who are doing the selfies and walking all the way over and like leaning over the edge and taking the photo. And, and there's so many of them that the number of like, you know, certain like couple hundred people people die there every year there's no yeah. railings you can't put a railing around the entire giant empty place and then they have a book about the people who <laughs> died there and you're like why are you selling this yeah. <laughs> too close oh god yeah i've never been in the grand canyon that sounds that, but that but i would do i would do i would do the same shit you do i'd go and i'd look right over the edge yeah and you can't um you can't actually grasp it like i think i would need to go on one of those well, I would never, but one of those horse rides where they walk you down the cliffside into the valley to like truly understand the scope of it because it looks like a painting. Wow. And you're like, you're like, okay, all right, brain, those dots are trees that are <laughs> as big as buildings. No, nope, still can't Not doing grasp it. it. Not you doing know, it. You go through the little museum and they're like, you know, it's grown by 14,000 feet since the dinosaurs or something because of all the erosion. You're like, I still don't get it. I can't grasp it. Can't grasp it. It's big, big empty place. But I had <laughs> right before or right after I got kicked out of film school, I had a I was like trying to um, get a degree in something. So I was like, I'll do communications. <laughs> and, you know, it, who gives a shit? But I got to get a degree. I got to get, get something. But um, I had a teacher who was like it was a geology class. She, I remember her saying, saying, like, the first time I went to the Grand Canyon, I cried. And I was like, what a dork. But I have a feeling if I went there, I saw that scenic painting, I'd be like, America. <laughs> I, I, I cried at uh, the pyramids. Oh, that would be something. Yeah, we went to Egypt for a shoot, and we got, like, a half day to go adventure around. And we got to the pyramid. I rode a camel to the pyramids. <laughs> That's cool. And, um, and it flipped me on the ground. <laughs> 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 but... um. I, I rode a camel to the pyramids and I got off and I climbed up one of the stones and I pushed my hand onto it and just touched it. And I just started weeping like every Bible story I've ever heard that, you know, took place in Egypt, all the slavery that was there. And like it was like all of history came weighing down on me. And I'm not big into history. Right. I have a really hard time watching anything that takes place. Not now. Mm -hmm. In a movie. Right. Oh, my God. It's so hard to watch something that's like Victorian era, let alone like go back to Egypt. But, man, I don't know what it was. Just like there is sorrow there. And there is like history of like, I don't know, just like great things and horrible things and supernatural things. And, yeah, it moved me. That's uh, the only experience I've had. It's anywhere close to that is when we um, for the very I've only done a little bit of ghost tour or ghost. I guess it's ghost tours because we weren't really hunting any. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he goes, was the uh, it, we were in London and we did the Jack the Ripper tour. Ooh. And like that was like some of the first ghost stuff that we ever did. And I remember thinking like, all right, well, let's see how interesting this is. And then like you're standing there in Whitechapel and they're like, this is where the first prostitute was found. And you're like, oh, OK, so it is real <laughs> because over here in the States, you're like Jack the Ripper. Like, oh, it's just whatever. And then you're there at the sites of the victims and you're like. Oh, like people really died. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is Oof. this is kind of kind of heavy. Yeah, and he was like, um, one of the most. I, my wife Courtney knows the actual statistics, but we were watching the Son of Sam thing that just yeah, came yeah, out, yeah. and she was saying that like Jack the Ripper was like the most accomplished quote unquote serial killer of all time. At that point, he had killed like five people, you know. Yeah, and then this happened. The numbers went up. They were like, those are rookie numbers. Yeah. Did you ever see From Hell? 
the Johnny yeah. Depp film. Yeah. I like the way ja- uh, the guy who plays Jack the Ripper has a really cool line that George always talks about. He's like, I'm bringing in the 20th, 21st century or something like that. Like he's, because <laughs> it happened like 1890 or something yeah. like that. So he was like, well, hope this next decade doesn't suck. I'm going to start out with killing a bunch of fucking people. <laughs> that That's a, uh, those are, those are, those are fun. It's weird. That's what's scary in real life. Like the heights and the coffins or in that coffins, I'm, I'm thinking of buried right <laughs> yeah, now, and yeah, I'm like, yeah. <gasps> breathe. What was what's been the scariest horror movie you've seen? Um, yeah, someone else asked me this recently, and I think, I think it's the remake of the 2013. I think it was 2013 remake of Evil Dead. Yeah, that for some reason, I I remember being in the theater with my feet on the seat holding my legs like and i'm i'm a big guy i don't that's not a position i'm comfortable in but it was a <laughs> necessary the movie theater one seat. Those i was are... stressed out and they did something with the demonology uh of it that just like rang very very true and i remember watching the trailer for that and there's a moment where she's sitting in the bunk bed and she says i think it's in here with us and she whispers it um and I remember seeing that in the trailer and being like, oh, I'm not going to be scared at that. That's so lame. And when it happened in the movie, I was like crapping my pants. I was so scared because I believed it was in there with them. That movie is so good that the crop of horror fans that hate remakes, even in there, like, no, that one's yeah. that one's legit. My my dad has a really funny story. So um, that movie came out a few years before he retired. Um, and he he worked at a Honda uh, in Marysville, Ohio. So he had to get up really early and, and he would drive there, but he would like have his coffee and check, you know, the news and the weather. And around the time the evil dead remake was coming out, you know, there, the, 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 the gag that evil dead likes to sort of do is like the person underneath the stairs, like, you know, yeah, yeah, out, yeah. Out. they had a, uh, an advertisement online where it would come up at the bottom of your screen and it would be her. And she would <laughs> let me out, let me out. And it would freak him the fuck out. So like that movie just scared the shit out of everyone. Um, and it was also really well done. Um, Fetty Alvarez, uh, the director, mm-hmm. that guy is just amazing. He, what he does, else has he done? I think, I'm so terrible with names. I like I never know. So Fetty Alvarez, uh, he also did. Um, he worked on the Ash versus Evil Dead. The, oh, the I haven't show. seen that. Um, I've seen the first two seasons. I love it, but I do this weird thing with TV shows where when it ends, I don't watch the ending because I don't want it to end in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I've uh, been watching The Sopranos for like ten years. <laughs> it's 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 hard to do. So he did. Um, he also did Don't Breathe. Oh, which was another kind of that was great. That like the ending kind of like really grossed me out. The turkey baster. Oh scene. God. Yeah, oh, it there's had, a second one. I think they have a second one coming. They have a out. second one coming out, which is really weird because how was Stephen Lang is going to get anywhere? <laughs> yeah, I, don't I don't know. But that uh, Don't Breathe had um, one of the the coolest uh, death scenes, the slow mo death scene with the gun in his mouth and the flash from the gun like lit up the dude's cheeks. Oh yeah, that was a G Money or his name or something like that. That was cool. Uh, but no, that that Evil Dead um, that scared the shit out of me too because. I saw it in a shitty movie theater in my hometown for like five dollars, and there's like two other people. Oh, and the yeah. the effect, the, and the and there's not a lot of movies that I think do gore real effectively. Mm-hmm. Like some of them try to do it just because it's a horror movie, got to have gore. But he really knocked it out of the park with the Evil Dead. Like the, yeah, it, the cutting off the arm in the just, kitchen. It has like, that fleshiness feel to yeah. it. Like you can feel like the chunkiness. Yeah. of it. Um, there's. <laughs> <laughs> how are you how are you with gore in films? I'm actually I'm okay. Um but it has to have it has to be there for a reason. So like I'm a huge fan of the first 3 Saw movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've watched them all and I went and saw Spiral. And like I'm at the point now where I can watch that type of gore and be fascinated by the filmmaking mm-hmm. and like try and figure it out or like, you know, be like, "Oh, giggle and giggle and gross." Um but the the first three Saw movies, especially the first two, um, had like such deep story and meaning behind it that, mm-hmm. um, and I think the first one, if I'm remember, remembering correctly, it didn't actually show much. It was all off screen, which is really like the way to do it. The pull um, of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah. Where everyone's like, "Oh, there's cannibals and blood," and then you watch it and you're like, "It's like a little bit of blood." Yeah, a li- a little bit. It's yeah, it's more the the grisliness of the like the feeling i don't even know because i watched texas chainsaw for the first time a couple of weeks ago and um 
I was very disturbed by it, but I don't know why. I didn't really see that much. Well, I can tell you what, because in Bravo's Top 100 Scariest Horror Movie Moments of All Time, <laughs> Rob Zombie points out the fact that um, because of its low budget, it's it's almost kind of shot like a documentary. Yeah. And so it kind of looks too real. Plus, the production of that movie is also really weird and has like mafia tie-ins with and it. And the sounds. The sounds are like grating on on you. Like I, mm-hmm. I found myself getting exhausted from the sounds. Yeah, that's a. Oh, and they got the hammer at the. End. Oh my god. Do you? <laughs> so, like when I was in high school and like MySpace was big, <clears throat> I remember like when you like would customize MySpace, and I remember uh, before you could adjust like your top eight and all that shit. Like I would do the like, HTML to put like Pinhead is there and Jason mm. and Freddie. And then like, I would decorate my site <clears throat> or my MySpace with gifts of like a lot of horror stuff at the time. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it was like Japanese horror. Cause they had like the real gory stuff and, um, some other American movies. But I kind of think the older I get, like I'm kind of getting like a little sensitive to yeah. gore. Is that how, does that happen to you? I, I don't really watch war movies anymore. Like to me, that is it. It's too real, and it's stuff that I don't want to process or deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, so, gore in a war movie does more to upset me. If it's over the top, like I just watched Hatchet for the first time. And yeah. I mentioned him on this um, <laughs> slasher kick, um, and he like straight out of the gate, you meet this uh, Victor Crawley guy, and he mm-hmm. comes out and rips someone's face in half through their mouth and like (laughs) i was cheering alone in my room with my headphones on just like yeah because it's ridiculous right and i don't think it's going to happen to me but like the saw when i saw spiral i really enjoyed it but the gore yeah it made me sick to my stomach because i could imagine that happening to my body i could imagine my fingers being pulled off yeah you know or like my tongue being stuck in something it's a little bit too like a little too real too too realistic like oh shit what if someone did that to me because you know uh, as an adult i watch a lot of true crime stuff too and you hear about the btk killer and mm-hmm. and stuff like that and you're just like that there's people out there who are okay with fucking you up well, big it, time it, there's there are some really um interesting gore and horror movies um mel gibson seems to keep coming <laughs> coming up but and we were soldiers <laughs> Uh, did you ever see that one, the Vietnam one? Yeah. That scene where they pick up the guy and his- And the napalm and the skin comes the off. The skin comes off yeah. like cheese, like hot cheese yeah. on a pizza. Yeah. That that shit kind of fucks me up. I can't- Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but there was, um, for, in terms of gore like affecting me like I, as I get older, I keep joking because I just turned 30 like a couple weeks ago. Mm. And I keep telling everyone, you know, now that I'm wise and 30, I- <laughs> um, the, the last horror film that I saw that had gore that it really affected me, um, because it served the story, which I think is really interesting, was Revenge. Um, it's the film on Shudder where uh, basically this woman gets pushed off this cliff, lands on a tree, and then goes and seeks revenge. But cool. that scene is awful to watch because, first of all, she's like like this, like hanging yeah. off a tree. And uh, I think uh, she's with some real shady guys. And uh, they have some drugs on her. I think they have like really strong ayahuasca or something like that on her. So then she just pops that and then trips. And it's her sur- doctoring herself up. And it's the first time in a while where I was like, oh, God. Yeah. I don't know if I can sit through this. That was hereditary for me with the piano string. Oh, like, yeah. That was the, that was, I think, maybe one of the first times I've ever truly been like, I might have to leave because I'm so upset. Yeah. Um. And it was the sound design that did it. That like hollow, like you can only, you know, in your throat. <laughs> oh, yeah. That hollow that sawing well. sound. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Um. That and then I that made me so afraid to watch Midsummer that I put it off. I I wish I had seen it in the theater, but I put it off. And that has another scene, you know, with the sledgehammer that's just like so graphic. It's interesting you said. We're, it, we're, I think we're plotting this really cool path where the gore. It can't just be gore for gore's sake. Well, if it is, it, it, you you have the cheering moments like you did mm-hmm. with 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 Hatchet. But if you have the the gore that's serving the story, it's sort of like uh, it's like a cheeseburger, and then like okay, or your hamburger. And you're like okay, well, what, what have we do to make this a cheeseburger to doctor it up? And then the sound design I think is interesting. It's it's really fascinating. You, you mentioned um, Ari Aster's movies because I just last night retweeted. I forget the the name. Uh, she had a really great article out about Ari Aster's sound design mm. because that's like a huge huge thing that makes it and um 
I think him and some other filmmakers did this thing where I forget the hertz or the frequency. It was like 20 hertz, mm-hmm. and it's like real low. And I guess it's one of those things where we can't hear it, but we feel it. And yeah. they use that to unsettle us. And I guess he did use the shit out of it in, her, in Hereditary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, Heredi- that Hereditary is a another one that really fucked me up. Sound too. design is a big thing for me because um, that I we well, got that cool sound the sound. Escape stuff, the 360 sound stuff. Yeah, like, I, I started. That's your world. Yeah, I started that um, on YouTube because I, I love reading books and I love watching movies. Um, but, but I love the way that, like, in a book, you're kind of hallucinating as you read. Like the words go away and you start to imagine these things. And part of me was like, well, what if, what if you could hear? you know, like, what if you could be there? Mm-hmm. Like, how close can you possibly get? And so if I'm telling a story and it takes place in the woods and someone's chomping through the leaves, like, what if you could hear that? And when you hear it, you almost start to feel it, you know, if it's the right kind of sound design. And so I don't just take stock sounds and toss them in. A lot of times there's, like, 10 or so layers of, like, how do I build an outside? Well, it's got to have, it's nighttime, so it has to have crickets. It has to have wind. It has to have leaves rustling, but it also has to have tall grass kind of moving. Mm -hmm. And in the background, you know, there's a highway like a mile away. So there's a faint sound of like cars and that's the base layer. And then there's music on top of that. And then on top of that is like, okay, someone's going to fall in the leaves. Well, there's a sound of cardboard boxes being crunched. There's a sound of leaves. There's a sound like two or three sounds of leaves. And and then there's like a a deep, you know, like one of these like low hertz uh, pound sounds. And it's that stacking that makes it actually feel real. And I, th- it, it takes so much work and I don't, <laughs> there's no reward for it other than like feeling giggly when I listen to the final <laughs> right. one. I'm like, if I'm giggling listening to it, then I know it's ready to go out. You know what's funny is not to bring the world of high fashion into this, but um, I am so ready. I, I, we are very, I, we are very fashionable. <laughs> Here comes our two. Um, <laughs> but uh, there was a, I think it was a masterclass or documentary with Anna Wintour, and she kept saying this thing that I kept gravitating to. She kept saying texture. She would look at a piece of clothing. She'd be like, it doesn't have texture or an outfit. It doesn't have texture. And as like a video editor myself, like I started taking that into consideration, like when it comes to comes to visuals. Um, but it, that's what you did with the sound design. You, you didn't just have the, the, the wind and the crickets. And then and most people are like, oh, that's nighttime. You added all that texture into it. And that texture is what gave it this character and built the world. And I think I just think as a creative, that's such a fascinating thing to talk about is texture. And and most people don't realize this, but I, I noticed it when I was showing my parents movies that I was excited about, is that if the video was grainy, if the lighting was bad, if the acting was off, everybody just watched it. If the sound design was off, suddenly everyone's a critic. Oh, this person's performance isn't so good. Oh, this <laughs> this looks kind of grainy. This is a shaky video. You know, I think sound is the most important part of telling a story because or at least telling a visual story because without it you're left with this like emptiness that you can't put your finger on and you start to problem solve Mm. you start to try and figure it out and it's the difference for me between like the conjuring films and Ari Aster's films the sound design is so like intentional in his films and in the conjuring universe it's these sounds that we've heard in every single movie copy and pasted into like the demons always have cracking bones. That's one thing I've, I've been harping on the past couple of days. <laughs> oh, you're right. They it's do. always like, oh, how many bones do you have and why are they all broken? It's like a dog toy or something. Yeah. It's and and the devil made me do it. They advanced it and it has, there's this like surging, like um, bowels sort of sound that comes with the bone crunching and it worked for me it freaked me out but a lot of the like earlier annabelle movies the um it's very dry the nun there's this it's just like it's a head of lettuce you know they're just like it's the same you, head the, of you lettuce can see the foley just, artist exactly and they just knife. toss it in there's no layering there's no like nuance to it um and for some people that works for me it, it doesn't i'm just like too i guess tuned in after so many years well that's why i think it's so weird. All this, I keep wheeling everything back to David Lynch. And I wasn't even the biggest, thing, but he's a bit, his thing is sound. I think he does his own sound editing. Mm. Um, but there's an episode of, of Twin Peaks, uh, The Return. Did you, have you seen any of The Return? No. Um, I think it's like episode six. It's called Got a Light. 
and it's definitely the most horror episode because there's these like weird guys who keep going got a light got a light and they like rip you know (laughs) they kill a couple people um but then uh there's a scene where you go into an atomic explosion so like you see it from a distance and the sound design in this thing is it has that quietness but there's also things that are leading your ears um and they use a song that i hate I cannot listen to the song, and if you want to scare yourself, listen to this. I think it's called like the Victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Oh no! And it sounds basically. I think what the composer was going for is what it sounds like to be in that destruction and that terror. Mm. And he did an A plus plus job on it. Um, it is very scary, and David Lynch uses it really well. It also once came up one day because um, we were talking um, earlier about horror scores i was trying to find some good horror scores and i think i was listening to like shape of water stuff and some del toro stuff mm-hmm. um and then that song came on and like i was like <laughs> like i jumped and i was like i can't do this um but that episode got a light i think is a master class in scaring you through sound oh man i'm gonna have to watch that if, <laughs> get great you know you're gonna need a an edible and a bible <laughs> to, <laughs> to get you to get you through it's it it's my kind of movie it's your yeah it's your kind of yeah. it's your kind of jam the sound design is so interesting. I, I've never actually got to have a conversation about sound design. Mm. Like, that is that is the one thing that I think um, – because cause like we're, we're both in L.A., everyone's a filmmaker, and whenever you get into filmmaking stuff, people always say, you know, don't worry about the body, get some nice glass when they're talking about getting you a camera or something mm-hmm. like that, and they go, get some lights. Um, and then people always talk about having good audio, but they always leave it at just, like, make sure you get the actor's dialogue good. Mm-hmm. Like and the, to them, if you get the actor's dialogue good, then your case is done. But I, what I love about like what you said is like there's so much more than just like you got it on set or you had an ADR it and you got it good there. There's a lot more you can do that helps benefits the story. Yeah, yeah. And I I'm I, I went to school for musical theater. You know, like I'm I'm an actor, um, like by trade. I guess that's what I got my degree in, right, and then right. I never used it until I was on YouTube doing my own thing. But I I decided I didn't want that path for myself by the time I graduated um, and I became more of a camera operator, but I've always like I've held the boom pole and I've directed and I've acted and I've held the camera and the camera is what speaks to me as far as like my physical medium. Um, but the audio design is always the most important part of the editing for me because you know, like we we've, we've started to do a little bit of like animation stuff mm-hmm. and everyone on the team would be like, cool, great. And then I'll go through and add in all these like little pops and whirs and wings and bings and, and booms and all this stuff. And then afterwards it's just like, Oh, I didn't know. It is so underrated how much it adds to what the viewer is feeling. Yeah. Because I remember we did, uh, I did like a Patreon ad back when we were trying Patreon and I, I just, my skills, I can carbon copy whatever I see and then learn how to do it, which I'm a mm-hmm. big fan of. There's a book called Steal Like an Artist that I think. Hell but yeah. I copied um, Blizzard for over uh, the game Overwatch. They had their Halloween event. And I copied what they did. And one of the things I learned was what you just said was like, there was something where like, you know, I had the visuals of like an old timey subtitle horror film come up, but it would just, it would like the, the animation was like, like that. But see, mm-hmm. I even did the sound effect because I know that's, <laughs> but before it was just, that it came up. And then I stole the sound that they did and, it helps you connect so much. I th- I just think it's such a fascinating. Yeah, thing. It, it's the difference between like when when you see a um, when you go to a movie and they have the opening logos of the production house, mm-hmm. and it's the classic violins and you know the stars go around the planet or whatever, and you're like cool, but then you go and see like Chris Nolan's Batman, and there's the violins and the hum and the silence, and you're like excited <laughs> and your skin is crawling and you did like nothing has happened except they've shown you a logo mm-hmm. you know Whew. that feel there's there's nothing that beats that that yeah. feeling it's also nice to be able to go back to the movie theaters yeah yeah it has been nice i've been a bunch now have you we've only what, what have you seen um i saw a spiral i saw a separation i saw the conjuring the devil made me do it um and uh quiet place too I've heard good things about Quiet Place too. Does it does it yeah, live up? That's a lot of fun. Oh, okay. I gotta yeah. I gotta see it in the theater because I'm assuming you saw the first one in the theaters too. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
did your theater do the same thing where people who came in late with popcorn were like tiptoeing because it was so <laughs> silent? I that that feeling was amazing. Yeah, that happened a, a couple of times in The Conjuring Two. I was eating my popcorn uh, in The Conjuring Three. Also, um, I was eating my popcorn and they do this thing where it's like, and it's like dead silent mm-hmm. and the whole theater is silent. And I'm just like, I want to keep eating it because <laughs> I haven't had it in a year and a half. I know that's a, I, I, we went to the Limley and saw Cruella. Oh yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what to think, but Emma Stone rocks. The whole cast is great. And they switched, they, they, they changed Cruella's story too. Mm. She's no longer a puppy killer because it'd be kind of hard to root for yeah, a puppy killer nowadays. Oh, right. It's not really even a spoiler either. She just kind of has. A, she just kind of has this weird thing. Well, you'll see in the beginning of the movie why she hates Dalmi- <laughs> Dalmatians if you don't don't know it already. No, maybe I should see it then. I I was expecting it to be kind of terrible, but then part of me also had this like gut reaction to the trailer that it felt like Birds of Prey, and so it might be like really cool. You liked Birds of Prey too? Yeah. That how great was that? I thought it was really cool. Um, best one of the best DC movies hands, for sure. Hands yeah. down. I mean, it, I haven't even approached some of the, like the new, uh, the new cut of, oh, whatever. Justice yeah, I don't League. have four hours for. I do, and I that. still don't want to do. It. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 Cruella, I think you really like. Um, the the, one of the tentpole things in that film for me is the fashion, mm. because in this one, Cruella is a fashion designer working under this other fashion designer, and they kind of have their like back and forth, and then she kind of does this like. It's funny, in the new one, Cruella is a villain, and her go-to attack is guerrilla marketing. <laughs> she, like, like, she just keeps crashing this woman's event with these these outlandish, you know, lavish costumes, but they all rock. And when you see it on film, you're like, oh, shit, Cruella is that girl, man. I love her. Cool. Um, it's, 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 it's good stuff. Um, yeah, I... We're getting kind of close to the five thirty closeout, so I don't know how much longer you want to. <laughs> yeah, go. I could. I could. I could go forever. Yeah. Uh, th- uh, this is this is great. Um, so we should probably. Do you want to wrap it up or? Yeah, how, sure. How you feel? So okay, I really want our listeners to follow you because th- there is not a lot of good horror content creators out there. So can you tell them where to find you, where to follow you, where to hear your soundscapes, where to see your reviews? All right. So for daily. Uh, for daily one minute videos, uh, horror reviews, horror movie review. Oh, I'm going to start over Editing. <laughs> for daily sound design <laughs> for daily content on TikTok, It's haunting season. I do horror movie reviews, folklore, urban legends, and hauntings. Um, and you know, uh, it's fun. Uh, it's not too scary. So if you're like on the cusp of horror, like I'm the perfect guy for you. Cause I'm just like a jolly guy with a beard <laughs> um on youtube i'm doing every other week right now because things are busy um but it's original scary stories to listen to in the dark with headphones it's 360 degree soundscapes and again they're all stories that i've written out of the i say out of the bowels of my mind um and then my podcast haunting season right now is just a mirror of the youtube because you could do it with or without the video the video right. is just me standing in a black void um <laughs> This, because uh, this particular black yeah, this void. particular black void um but i'm currently developing the podcast what i want to do with it and what i'm hoping to launch in the next month is to have people on to tell me their true life story of a haunting or a ghost or even just like you know some something within the realm of of scary thing that happened to you in a five to ten minute story that's in the style of my YouTube I'm show. I'm already sold. <laughs> and then the yeah. second half, we're going to talk about it, and I'm going to get to ask all my questions. Dude, that is a killer goddamn concept. Cool. Damn. That's great, because I've been like really struggling with, like, why, why can't the podcast just be a podcast? Why is it a mirror of the YouTube show, you know? You know what I love about it is is – a lot of people, they feel like, you know, th- this we've, we've recently changed to just long form shoot the shit because we feel like we get the best conversation of just mm-hmm. shooting. But what I like about it is there's no rules with co- podcasts. And a lot of people start to put these rules on it. And the fact that you're like, I want to tell this and then we want to cut to that. And there you go. It's like, I love that. Cool. I know exactly what I'm going to get. <laughs> I'm going to and I'm going to enjoy it. Man, this has been fun. Yeah, could, I mean, I honestly, I could talk. If I didn't have to pee right now, I would. Yeah, if, we I know. if we didn't have places to go, people would see. We'd be here till like eleven thirty. Yeah, just for to get you know ten percent. Well, and we live that. like a couple of streets apart, That's, so that like, is, let's do this again, even if it's not on a recording. Like ex- you know, absolutely. So this is fun. Boils and goals. You know what to do. Uh, give us. I don't think we've had a 
recent iTunes review. Uh, last time I told people to type STL, and it had something to do with Mike Flanagan's degloving. Oh, they did a hand emoji. Mm. For this review, all right, five-star review on iTunes. Actually, if you've ever been ghost hunting, just comment that. And then a ghost emoji. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do that. And then, uh, then, we'll, and then we'll see where where the where the viewers have been. Because apparently we have we have viewers, uh, some listeners, in some like really strange areas that I wouldn't have imagined. What makes it a strange area? It's like, well, it's the fact that like out of the whole like m- like map, they'll be like the only one. <laughs> so it's like uh, so it's like a huge country. Right. And, so like, you got the, L.A., New York, and Alberta, Canada. Yeah, somewhere in the Middle East, there's like yeah. one listener. And so I'm like, where? What's ghost hunting like there? Cool. Probably a lot more sand, so. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, the gin. That's the thing I wanted to tell. Well, uh, well okay. Give us a review. I'll talk to you guys later. <laughs> talk to you guys later. <laughs> see, you guys. see you guys next time. Love you guys. Bye.